So last week when I told you the story about the um, food pantry and, and the lady who didn't, or, or the, um, the pad shelter and the lady who didn't want that, it reminded me of another story mm -hmm. from that exact same time period of my life that I wanted to share with you today because I'm, today I'm sort of addressing the issue that someone emailed me about in the background when I asked about what are the sermons that we need to hear but maybe we don't want to hear. Um, and, and the person said, could you please help us understand what it truly means to love one another? They had seen a sign somewhere on another church that said, love one another. And they realized that when they saw those words, love one another, they didn't really know what that meant. So they emailed me in the background and said, could you please help us understand what it means to love one another? I emailed back, I don't think I know. <laughs> I don't think I know. But I do have this story that I think might help us to begin illustrating that. And it comes from that time when that um, pad shelter was being created and all of this sort of stuff. And one of the things that I was helping to do was to serve the meal. And, and pads, I don't know if you know about pads, but pads is uh, put together on shifts. So you work like the dinner shift and then you can be gone. Or you can you work like from the beginning of the dinner shift till like 11 at night and then the next shift comes in at 11 at night to 7 at night when folks are sleeping. And so I was working the uh, dinner shift where I would just help to serve the food to folks, right? And sometimes we knew that folks were coming to get food, but they were not staying overnight to sleep there. And so there was, a, there was one particular family that came, um, and every time this particular family came and we were serving them food, I would start to hear in the background, blah, 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 that kind of like rumble. And I never really knew what it meant, but I started to hear some things like, they don't need this, they don't need to be here, why are they here, blah, 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 blah. And, and I was not understanding quite exactly what that was for the church, but I was understanding what that meant sociopolitically, right? That the people serving thought that that family had no reason to be there to get free food, right? So I just kind of tried to not let it bother me, and I just kept serving and serving and serving. And then one night, Steve and I took the kids to Old Country Buffet. Anybody remember Old Country Buffet? You walk in, you used to be able to walk into Old Country Buffet, pay your $7.99, and you could eat all night long if you wanted to. <laughs> now I think it's this astronomical price. But, but what happened was, was that we were sitting at the table with our two kids eating dinner, and I saw that family that we were serving at the PADS program walk in to sit down and eat. And in the back of my mind, they don't need that food. They're taking advantage of us. They are out to get us for whatever they can get from us. Sort of started to work in my mind. So I was really kind of upset about it that here I was as a young parent. We were young parents trying to, you know, make our food dollar stretch as far as it could. And on the nights when we could go out for a nice dinner, we went to Old Country Buffet because the kids, we could fill them up and take them home and they'd go right to bed because they were so full, right? <laughs> and then to see a family that I knew that I had been serving food to at the PADS program come through the door. And it started to work on me that Maybe I was being taken advantage of. Maybe they're really using us. Maybe they are out to somehow take advantage of the system that was out there for them to get help. And they're taking the place of other people who, um, who need that food more than they do. Now, what I didn't tell you was is that I don't know if they had a gift card that somebody had gifted them to bring their kids out for a nice night, right? One of the traps that we get into when we're trying to figure out for ourselves who does and who does not need help is we forget that sometimes the people that we deem as not using needing our help have already gotten help from someone else and they're just taking advantage of it. We also forget the dignity issue of the fact that they had just as much right to show their kids a nice time as I had to show my kids a nice time, right? We get into this trap of believing that people who need our help don't need any dignity. And when we see them acting in the same sorts of dignity that we want, then we get mad because they're acting with this dignity that's supposed to be reserved for the people who can't afford it, right? So I go to the pastor, and the pastor was just new there, and I wasn't 
I wasn't in, you know, sort of a relationship with the pastor very much, but I went in and I said, something's heavy on my heart. And the first thing he said to me was, don't throw that evangelical language at me. I don't want to hear that. (laughs) Okay. I said, something's worrying me. Something's bothering me. (laughs) And he said, what? And I told him the story. And he said, well, so what? Feed her and her family when they come through the door. Should have been my first clue that I was going to have trouble (laughs) for a little bit. And I said, well, why should we feed these people that are taking advantage of us? And he said, how do you know they're taking advantage of you? I said, because I saw them out spending money. They have five children. I have two. I know how much it costs for two children and two adults. They have five children and two adults. I know how much money that costs. And he says, wow, aren't you superior? (laughs) Ooh, well... Back in those days, my self-esteem was about that high, and for anybody to say that to me really devastated me. And I said, what, it, what do you mean? And he said, God didn't ask you to like what you are doing. God just asked you to do it. You need to get out there and do what needs to be done. And if this is a situation of being taken advantage of, what does it matter to you? You're not the one paying for their food. And so it rankled me, and it rankled me, and it rankled me, and it rankled me. But I still went out, and I still served the food to this family when they would come every week for the, f- for the PADS program. And it took me a long time to begin to understand that God does not ask us to like the people or to even like the job that God gives to us. God asks us to do the job in love. This is what it means when we hear the Apostle Paul writing about love. You know, I love it when um, young couples who want to get married come and they're all so filled with all of that feeling about, you know, oh, we're in love, love is patient, love is kind. Yeah, wait until the 1500th time you pick his socks up off the floor. (laughs) Love is not so patient. Love is not so kind in those situations. But I began to understand that what God is asking of us is not about how we feel. It's about how we understand this world. Many of us, I think, get caught in that trap of, I have to love, meaning I have to feel something for the people that are coming, and they better deserve what I feel for them, right? We put up that boundary that says they better deserve what. I'm going to give to them through God. They had better be willing to show me how thankful they are or I, I won't feel what I need to feel about doing this ministry. And I think that we can then look at the scripture and see that Christ never once questioned whether or not the people that he was serving deserved the love with which he was working in their lives. He didn't walk up to anybody and say, hey, I hear that you have had a seven-year bleed. Do you want me to cure that? Oh, well, do you deserve it? Have you worked hard enough for it? Why do you think you should have it over this person? Because I only have so much energy. I'll give it to this person if you aren't deserving. We don't see Christ doing that. We just see out of Jesus this continual flow of what it means to be like God in this world. And as I've grown older and as I have made mistake after mistake after mistake after mistake, what I have come to realize about God's love is that it is about giving me the benefit of the doubt all the time. That God's love is so strong and so real and so filling of us that it doesn't have to be about roses and hearts and I feel for you and I feel for you. It has to be about looking at another person and giving them the benefit of the doubt that what we have, they might need. And we are so blessed ourselves, we can give that away. We can give it out into this world. You see, the Holy Spirit works upon us to do love, not to feel love necessarily. Now, I do believe that you need to feel compassion. You need to feel that there is hurt here and you can do something to help that. 
But I think a lot of times we get ourselves so wrapped around this word love that it means we have to feel something while we're doing it or feel overwhelmingly great and filled with all of the roses, all that stuff, as I said, that we then don't do the work that God asks us to do because if we don't have that feeling, we somehow then turn it into if I don't feel for a person, it means there must be something wrong there. You see, we have taken this idea of eros love, feeling love, and we have superimposed it onto God's love, agape love. Aren't you impressed that I know those Greek words? Agape love. And we have made it seem that the only reason why we act in this world is because we feel something. Back to the story with the woman that I'm serving the food to with her family. You know, when I stopped worrying about whether or not she deserved that food, I got to know that lady. And that lady was living a horrible life. And I found out that the reason why they were at the Old Country Buffet that night was because a family member had given them a gift card at Christmas time to go to the Old Country Buffet. And they thought, let's take the kids out and get them out of all of this stress and trouble that we normally feel. Let's use this gift card that a family member gave us so that we can take a break. But it wasn't until I began to realize that God is asking me to feed and I don't necessarily have to be in love with the person to feed them. I don't necessarily have to feel like this person is so attached to me that I can never live without them before I can actually serve them without any kind of boundaries. I learned that lesson that that pastor wanted me to learn, but it took me a very, very long time to begin to understand that when we're talking about love, what does it mean to love one another? We stop ourselves when we get lost in that thought that we have to like or feel something for the other. What we have to realize is God likes and feels something for that other and because of that, we're called to help God serve that other in this world. As I wrote back to the person in the email, I'm not sure that I really know what it means to love one another because I think that that's something that we're going to work on for the rest of our lives. But one thing that I hope that I'm getting more and more assured of is, is that the more that we put up this idea of having to feel something to act, the less we are going to act. And the church is called through this first mission statement of Jesus that is in Luke 4, this first mission statement that he borrowed back from the prophets. The church is called to continue acting like God in this world, even when we can't feel like God. And I want to say that again because I think that that's a hard lesson for all of us to learn. We are called to act like God even when we don't feel like God. We are called to go out and to clothe those who are naked. We are called to go out and to feed those who are hungry. We are called to go out into this world and bring release to one another. We are called to act always and leave our question at the doorstep when we go out to do that. I think perhaps maybe that is the tough question. The tough question for us today is how can I love like God? Which means how can I act like God in this world? How can I go out in this world and let all of my judgments and let all of my fears and let all of my decisions fall away and simply do what needs to be done in this world? 
How can we do that? I think that's a lifelong question for us. How can we love one another? How can we act like God with one another? I want to read for you something that I ran across um, as I was studying this week because I think it helps to define where we find ourselves at in this time of pandemic. In this time of pandemic, we've been worried about what the church is doing, what are we doing as the church, that sort of thing, how are we being the church. And I ran across this idea that was written in one of my um, study books. And it says that the Reverend Joan Gray says, when you really think about it, this dumanos of the spirit is the only thing that the early church had going for it. And she goes on to say that the church today keeps asking itself, how are we doing as a church? Are we surviving in this world? Are our bills paid? Are we taking care of things? She says that we ask all the time, how are we doing as a church? When the correct question is, what are we doing as a church? What are we doing to live out this mission of Christ in the world? What are we doing to feed and to clothe and to bind up and to proclaim release to? What are we doing to bring hope to others in this world that is feeling around us so hopeless? And I would assert to you that more often than not, what we are doing is we are judging and neglecting and feeling more bad about what's happening in our own lives than we are in the life of someone else who is struggling to get by. Maybe our tough question this week, it goes along with how can we love like God is, what are we doing? As a church, what are we doing to fulfill this mission of Christ in the world, this mission of loving the world as God loves? You see, it's all about action. I'm reminded that John 3.16 says that God so loved, he gave. Meaning that love moves us into letting God help this world and maybe our judgments and our determinations cause us to actually stop the work of God in this world. So I don't have the answer to what it means to love one another, but I have an inkling that what it means is, is that we are called to act even when we don't understand even when we don't like the person who needs God's love, even when we don't particularly feel that flowery, overwhelming thing that we have defined as love, we are called to act. And how can we be about that in this world? Amen.